and in its place Christendom set up. So Jewry went. Now we can't say on this particular day, this particular hour, this all happened. We can only say that the death knell was signed, rang out at Calvary when Christ led captivity captive. And then of course as Paul was saying in the New Testament, the former Testament was waxing old. You see, that period of time was waxing old. Everything was waxing old. It was disappearing gradually, 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 gradually. And then come AD 70, the, the whole lot. 70 to 71, the whole lot. Under Imperial Roman forces from out of the various nations of this world came against Jerusalem and sacked it and burnt down the temple. And of course the Romans didn't want to burn the temple down but God's hand was there. Jesus Christ the Lord would have them burn down the temple because he himself is the only one true temple. There's no temple going to stand in front of him. Not one in this day and age. No, oh, the millennium. So we're going to build a temple, stone temple. Aye, yes. Because you don't like Jesus Christ being the temple of God. You can build whatever temples you like. We have Christ as our true temple. Now then, having said all that, repeating again, the foundations of our faith and it is our faith because it's given to us as a present from God it's a gift of God by the hand of God his arm stretched out to us it's ours he's made it ours it's imputed unto us so it's ours we cannot reject it and we will not reject it because we are new man in Christ Jesus we're going the way of Christ we're going the way of justice, of truth and of honour, of, of integrity. Okay? And we live, hopefully, this world to help others. Through this world and in this world. And also to reprove those that need to be reproved. Okay, and We need a just weight and a just balance. And of course that comes through growing in knowledge and understanding of all things of all things that we have to handle okay now then George Muller hmm? he was of the brethren movement well, we know what the movement <laughs> is. I mean, they might as well put on cassocks, you know, or these, these uh, gowns and the ladies put on penguin outfits. Um, because it's totally papish. And, of course, John Nelson Darby was a total papist in spirit. Oh, wow. yeah, total papist. That's why you have the closed brethren. A closed order. And you say, well, you know, uh, it's not like the papers. It, it is like the papers, and it's like the Anglicans. You go and see a penguin walking down the street. Okay? There are some closed orders, strict closed orders, in the Roman Church. But mostly, as with the Anglican Church, you have the penguins on the street, all right? And the monkeys on the street with their garbs, all right? And the brethren movement is just the same. But they're close to the public, you see, in the sense that they have, are separated from the public. They are holier than anybody else. And the brethren movement is just the same. Doesn't matter if it's closed or open, they're, 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 they're the same. And they won't vote, well, I, I won't go into that voting, but they won't have anything to do with the world as such. 
They're the same as the, the Papists and the Anglican Penguins and the rest of them. Um, because John Nelson Darby was a fire-spirited Papist, even though he proclaimed against Rome. And this is what fools the naive. <sighs> Test the spirits that see to see what is it? Test the spirits to see if they be of God. Hmm? Test the spirits. Look at persons. Listen to what they say. Watch what they do because it defines what they are. Doesn't matter if a man stands up and says like, like Hitler, okay? Here's a good example. Hitler comes to mind. I am not going to invent Denmark and he stands up and makes this great big speech. How he's a friend of Denmark and you needn't worry. You know, I'll support you and we're not going to invade you. You're quite safe, blah, blah, blah. And he spends about an hour in, in eulogising Denmark. A couple of weeks later, he's, invented, he's invaded Denmark. And Quisling has his army to put down their arms and all these panzers are coming in and tiger tanks and the lot and the Luftwaffe is going overhead and, you know, it's not what a person says sometimes, it's what he does. It's contradictory. Like Spurgeon says he's a Calvinist and he was an Arminian. In practice, he was an Arminian. He believed in free will. He believed some of the most evil of doctrines. Well, people will go round him and say, well, he was a Calvinist. No, he wasn't. Read his history. Read what he believed. Listen to his sermons. Judge by what he says, what the man is. Okay, little sins comes always to mind. Where he, in Surrey Gardens, preached a sermon. Little sins. You read it. You listen to it. You listen to it. And he denies the fall. He denies Adam and the, Adam and the fall. He denies imputed sin. Openly. Openly denies it. He says man is not a sinner until he learns to sin. And he sins, learns to sin in his youth. We must keep away, he says, from learning to sin. You listen to the Surrey Gardens and then go and listen to the rest of his sermons with an eye towards scriptural doctrine. Don't take the man, but listen to the doctrine that he's coming out with. It's dreadful. <gasps> Unbelievable. No wonder he stood with Moody, Dwight Limus Moody, and declared himself to be an Arminian, and he declared himself to have the same gospel. If you read the Sword and the Trowel for, I can't remember the date, in the Sword and the Trowel, he stood and praised George Fox of the Quaker movement, and he even went to the Quaker movement at the behest of the Quaker movement to preach a eulogy on George Fox. And he was glad to do so. And he said his gospel was the same gospel as the Quakers. Now stick that in your pipe and smoke it. It's there. If you want to read it, you want to look it up, it's there. If you don't, just carry on shouting and bawling at people like us who have actually got off our backsides and researched these things. Now we come to Muller. George Muller, okay, attached to the Brethren movement, believed in Millennialism, and all the rest of it. Now, we're taking this from Christianity.com. <laughs> nice term, Christianity.com, because of what follows. That's why I say it's a nice term. We read this, it's eulogising um, George Muller. And it's a nice story that these neo-evangelicals are writing up about it. Okay, so let us begin. The children are dressed and ready for school. 
but there is no food for them to eat. The house mother of the orphanage informed George Muller. George Muller asked her to take the 300 children into the dining room. Notice it's not 301 or 299, it's 300, you see. 300 children into the dining room and have them sit at the tables. This is sounding a bit like who? Who is this sounding like? Come on. What? Who is this sounding like? Hmm? I'll repeat it. George Muller asked her to take the 300 children into the dining room and have them sit at the table. Remember past? Have them sit upon the ground, said Christ. And a precise number. Here's a precise number. Okay. Now then, carry on. He thanked God for the food and waited. Did not Christ? He did. Hmm? George knew God would provide food for the children, as he always did. Jesus Christ? Within minutes. Yeah, I tell you. Within minutes, a baker knocked on the door. Mr. Muller, he said, last night I could not sleep. Somehow I knew that you would need bread this morning. I got up and baked three batches for you. I will bring it in. Okay, that's Jesus Christ. Muller is Jesus Christ. No sooner had... Christ blessed the bread and the fish, the loaves and the fishes. Then God extended the whole thing out to the thousands, five thousand. <laughs> Suddenly, eh? this is a mirror image at a different time of a man called George Muller as Jesus Christ. Let's carry on. Soon there was another knock at the door. Oh my goodness. I haven't read this, by the way, before. Uh, let's go again. Soon there was another knock at the door. It was the milkman. His cart had broken down in front of the orphanage. The milk would spoil by the time the wheel was fixed. He asked George if he could use some free milk. George smiled at the milkman. Uh, brought in ten large cans of milk. It was just enough for the three hundred thirsty children. <laughs> oh, these milk churns. Milk in the milk churns. They used to go around on autumn cart and you'd bring your your vessel to the, and he'd weigh it out in his measure, in this scoop, and he'd fill your container, whatever container you'd got, in the milk churn, of course, last for days. <laughs> but that, that besides, okay, I mean, <laughs> it's crazy, absolutely crazy. I mean, when you, when you look that in, into the reality, not only lasts for days, but um, his cart had broken down in front of the orphanage. Well, wh what happened to his... Did the motor go or something? My big end's gone. Hey, eh? How did it break down? Wheel fell off? Because if the wheel fell off, the, the churns would fall off. The milk churns. <laughs> eh? Oh, it's, it's, just, it's just ridiculous, isn't it? Anyhow, it's, it's, it's a totally ridiculous story. And of course it reflects Christ, except for the milk. Okay. Um, but that is sold to us. That is sold to us as a, as a real event. So, what do we learn from this? From this neo-evangelical promotion of its own religion? Because this is what it's done for. You see, let's go back. 
the Puritan era is over, okay? It's ended. We had the Reformation period of the 1500s up until the 1600s, the mid, let's say mid-1600s, mid the Reformation had finished then. Then the Puritan era from the mid-1600s until just slightly after the 1700s. And then came this, what we know as neo-evangelicalism. That took over, and that is the predominant one now. The Reformation was the predominant one from the 1500s into the 16, mid-1600s. Predominant. Wherever you went, it was the Reformation. Reformation doctrine. Then he went to the Puritan era, and that was Puritans, all about Puritans. Puritan doctrine of the Reformation. And then now we've got this all-pervasive setup of neo-evangelicalism. And that's the neo-evangelicalism that is brought in with it in a substance, in a real substantial way, secularism. That's what is attached to neo-evangelicalism. And that's what neo-evangelicalism has brought with it. And we could go into the history of this. And of course, it really came to its zenith, if you like, in the 1800s. Oh, it was everywhere attacking Christianity. This neo-evangelicalism that posed as Christianity was attacking Christianity. And it, as we say, brought in this substance of secularism that equally attacked Christianity. Now, let us look at this. This fictional story. Let us just read part of it again. I'll ask you a question about this. Let's start from the beginning. One day... A friend invited George to go... Oops, I'm sorry, let's, let's go further down. Sorry, the children are dressed and ready for school. But there is no food for them to eat. The house mother of the orphanage informed George Muller. <gasps> George asked her to take the 300 children into the dining room and have them sit at the tables. He thanked God for the food and waited. George knew God would provide food for the children, as he always did. Within minutes, the baker knocked at the door. Mr. Muller, he said, last night I could not sleep. Somehow, I knew that you would need bread this morning. I got up and baked three batches for you. I will bring it in. What? is the question that we should ask here. Hmm? What is the question? This is the question. Remember, we're all in the household of faith. And being so, we're still under... Hmm? Governors and tutors, we're in the school of God. We are learning. And this is one lesson here that we need to learn, to embrace, learn. Not just listen and let it go, learn. Embrace it. Make it part of you. Make it part of me. Make it part of all of us, okay? And it's this, who is recording word for word what happened here? Hmm? Is there a person following George Muller around with a notebook? <coughs> hmm? Is there? Truly, is there an, a man or a woman hmm? going round hand in hand with George Muller 
In order to write this account, the children are dressed and ready for school. Get another pen. Oh, this one. Oh, pens. Oh, quill. I mean, quill. Oh, quill. Get another quill. Get some ink. Mm, oh, right. Got that down. The, the children are dressed and ready for school. But there's no food for them. Yeah. Right, children. Right. No food. Okay, I'll just write that down. Um, mm, the house mother of the orphanage informed George Muller. Oh, so he was with the house mother as well, was he? Wow. Okay, it doesn't get off off around a bit, does he? And George asked her to take the three hundred children. Now he's back with George, George, and the uh, house mothers with George now, and there's three hundred children precisely. And he's following them all into the dining hall, and he's sitting down, and uh, George, is, and it, it just goes on. This isn't real life, is it? Nobody walks around with us and takes notes of what we're doing. Only God does that. <laughs> it's crazy. Hey, so there was another knock at the door, it carries on, and there was a milkman. Oh, yeah, blah, 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 blah. Eh? Did he follow me into the bath? Did he sit in the bath with him? In the bathtub? George Mooney uh, washed underneath his arms, and George Mooney just, you know? Did he go to bed with him? Oh, it's one o'clock in the morning, George Mooney uh, fell asleep. Huh? Oh my goodness, I mean it's ridiculous. And what does this teach us? Come on, come on, what does this teach us? First of all, that it is fantasy, that it is all made.